words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the elders of the, uh, of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For it is uh, for in its welfare you will find uh, your welfare. And then... I'm go back to the scripture that David read in Jeremiah. Last week during the prayer time in worship over at Mount Zion, uh, one of the members there, Linda Sorrow, uh, asked, she lifted her hand and uh, she had a prayer request. She asked that we pray for the strength to build the church back up. Like most churches uh, these days, experiencing difficult times, either with uh, a dwindling population or an aging population or both. Uh, as it is in so many churches across the United States. Uh, that prayer is lifted up. And frankly, as Linda shared that prayer request, um, I haven't been able to get that thought off my head ever since. I thanked her during the worship service just a few minutes ago uh, for robbing me of my sleep all week long. I mean, uh, it's true, sometimes some things get our attention in such a way that we just can't stop thinking about it. And then this week, Jeremiah's message showed up in today's lectionary. And frankly, I took that as more than a coincidence. I felt that it was a certain prompting of God's Holy Spirit to lift up His plan for what we are to do to build the church back up. As you look around, I see many faces here that because of what you have shared with me, I know that you have been here for many, many years. And so as you think back upon the years when maybe even in the 1950s or 60s, this church was just packed full. Now you look around and it's just really a shell of what it used to be back then. And the footsteps of little children running up and down and getting into things and so on and so forth, all of those noises aren't necessarily uh, as active as they were back then. And so, building the church back up was Jeremiah's message. And today, I believe that he tells us in these few verses that David read from Jeremiah 29, I believe Jeremiah tells us exactly how to do what we must. I believe strongly that the Old Testament scriptures give us understanding of what Jesus came to do in us and through us, and that is to build the kingdom, and in some cases to build the kingdom back up in locations. Pleasant Hill is one of those places. Mount Zion is another one of those places, and we are not alone. Churches across the land are struggling as to what to do to build the church back. And frankly, the building process does not end when you build a building in Bennett or you build a building in Seagrove. As nice as the houses of worship are that we have, that's not the end of the building process. That's actually only a side issue of the building process. The building process has to do with the kingdom of God and that has to do with people. That process will be complete only when Jesus comes back for his bride. And until that time, whether it's in good times of plenty or whether it's in lean times when it's dark, our mission remains unchanged. We must be working on building God's kingdom until he comes. As I've already alluded to, this is no secret that we live in something of a dark time. It is culturally dark in our nation with ungodliness proliferating. Violence and anger rule in every dark corner. Sexual perversion is at a height most of us never dreamed would be possible in our culture. 
Dishonesty and lying and complete lack of integrity are rampant in government and business and even churches and in everyday life. It's hard to know who or what, if anything, to trust. And on a note that's very close to home, our United Methodist tribe is in a time of divisive, vitriolic upheaval that is almost certain to end in another general conference this coming year that will make the shootout at the OK Corral look like a minor disagreement between kindergarten children. Now, I don't say that to be cute or slick. I say it because it's the truth. The last general conference ended with such heartbreak on both sides, take your pick, that many of the leaders of the United Methodist Church worldwide see it as impossible for the United Methodist Church, as we have known it over the years, to stay together. Now, I'm not about to stand here and give you a six-step surefire plan that is going to fix the United Methodist Church or, frankly, grow this one. I'm at a loss for any of that as much as anyone who is in the pew today. You may say some fine words sometimes, but not much has worked. I'm not going to announce a 30-day fast or 40 days of planning and preparation for new programs that we've got up our sleeve that are going to change things. Now, I just want to point out what Jeremiah said to people who are going through darker times than we are right now. You say, well, how could that be? Let me give you a few little tidbits about what they were going through. They've had an enemy Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, Iraq, Iran, sound familiar? Invade Jerusalem. Conquer Jerusalem. Defeat and destroy the culture in Jerusalem. God's people. And oh, by the way, God engineered it as a disciplinary action for their lack of faith, their lack of following him. A lot of their people had been killed. Most of the rest of the competent people, sharp-minded, young, strong, had been carried off to Babylon a thousand miles away. What was left was broken down, unable to be sustainable. The ground was wrecked. And so I want to point out what Jeremiah said to these people who were going through that kind of dark times. First of all, he told them to live. He told them to live. What does that mean, Russell? <laughs> of course, you know, you have to tell people to live. People breathe in, they breathe out. That's natural. No, he was telling them to live in the sense that God's nation, Israel, demolished and demoralized as they were by King Nebuchadnezzar's stormtroopers, were told to live, and he told them to live despite the fact that their city, Jerusalem, lay in ruins. I mean, the walls had been torn down, broken down. The temple was desecrated and looted and burned. They didn't even have their place of worship. But Jeremiah did more than just say live. Jeremiah also told them to live with hope. With hope. And that's what I want to center our thoughts on for the next few minutes. This kind of hope that Jeremiah was talking about was not the hand-wringing kind that says, oh, I hope, I hope. It's, I hope Johnny comes home soon. I don't know where he is. I hope that I'll have enough money at the end of the month. I hope, I hope. It's not the hand-wringing kind of hope. The hope that Jeremiah was talking about was the certainty of God's promises in their lives. He was telling them to trust in God. He was telling them that their hope was in the God who had created them, the God who had spoken to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the God who had spoken through the prophets for all of those years. 
the God who gave them Moses, the God who gave them Joshua, the God who gave them freedom, the God who gave them life, the God who gave them everything, have hope in your life. I want you to notice in the text that the prophet told them that if they had hope, there were several things that were going to mark how they acted. He told them, first of all, to build. Build yourselves some houses. Are you kidding me? We're a thousand miles from home. You want us to build houses in Babylon and be happy about that when we want to get out of here. Jeremiah said, that will tell everybody, including you, that your hope is real. He told them to plant, plant some gardens. Make it beautiful. And he said, marry and have plenty of children and grandchildren. Well, there's a church growth program, isn't it? And then he told them, at the end of that text, to work for the peace and prosperity of where they were in battle. Wait a minute. These guys are our enemies. You want us to pray for peace for our enemies? You want us to pray for prosperity? You want us to put our shoulder to the wheel and give our life's energy? to bless those who took us away from our homes and made us slaves? Are you nuts? Jeremiah. It seems to me Jesus said something about that. If somebody strikes you on this cheek, you... If somebody takes your coat, you give them your tunic as well. If they compel you to go a mile, walk an extra with them. When they despitefully use you and are wicked toward you, pray for them anyway. They mean you evil, but God means it for good. Jeremiah went a little bit beyond the pulpit that day when he talked to people, former residents of Jerusalem. He began to demonstrate his preaching by buying a piece of property in a dead city. Jeremiah bought a plot of land in Jerusalem while he was in jail. Jerusalem, the broken down city, the wasted city, the worthless city. And Jeremiah paid a full price. It's kind of like your homeland is Chernobyl. Not going to be good for a hundred years. And you pay the price of a square foot of land in New York, you know, four million dollars. Jeremiah, what are you doing? You're throwing your money away. Okay, I know Israel's currency is worthless right now because we're a conquered nation. But you're throwing all your money away on this worthless piece of property. And you know, Jeremiah was in jail, but that's a fancy name for it. It's actually just a pit. There's a hole in the ground with bars overhead. Land was worthless in the conquered city, as was the currency. But God had said Israel still had a future. And when you believe God, you act that way. Jeremiah 32, three chapters later, verse 15. For this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says, Someday... People will again own property here in this land and will buy and sell houses and vineyards and fields. Let me ask you a question. Did that happen? You don't have to be a biblical scholar. How many of you know of 1947 and what happened in that particular year? What happened in that part of the world? Israel became a new nation again, right? The Jews started coming home. And they are not just surviving today, they are thriving today. So did it happen? Did God's word come true? Was Jeremiah's faith well-founded? Maybe not for Jeremiah. Tradition has it that he died in exile. He died in the pit. But it came true. <coughs> Jeremiah's preaching became Jeremiah's practicing. Folks, that's what we ought to do. We ought to begin to live with that hope. That means we live like what we say we believe. 
trusting God with our time, our time, our talents, our life's blood. We live not moping, hoping, giving our best, serving like servants, even when it's gone. We work like there really is a kingdom in the building process. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.